Hey everyone, it is your Peacekeeper coming at you with the next video in our How to Play series on the U.S. cruiser line. This is the Tier 7 Pensacola class cruiser. This is the first heavy cruiser in the U.S. cruiser line, and as a result of that, she has kind of a different playstyle, especially if you're used to playing the Cleveland and really got used to it. So we'll talk about that here in a minute, but we got some history to go through. The Pensacola class of cruisers consisted of two cruisers launched in 1928. That is the Pensacola and the Salt Lake City. The Pensacola class cruiser began as an evolution of a design study for the Omaha class scout cruisers. The design would be the first U.S. treaty cruiser under the limits imposed by the Washington Naval Treaty. The Pensacola class was designed to be sub-10,000 long ton cruiser armed with 8-inch guns, and as a result of the weight limit, extreme weight savings were taken in the construction of the ships, and as an example of that, her hulls were welded instead of riveted together, and her belt armor was very, very thin for an 8-inch gun cruiser. The Pensacolas were also extremely top-heavy as a result of having their triple gun mounts mounted on the upper deck above their dual gun mounts. And, of course, this giant tripod mast up here, uh, that also doesn't help with that. And so there were several sea-keeping stability-related issues with the class, which exacerbated the lack of enthusiasm for this class of cruisers. And as a result, the U.S. Navy rapidly switched away from the Pensacola class design and went on to the Northampton class design, which addressed many of the issues in the Pensacola class. In terms of their service history, Pensacola was one of six ships to receive the CXAM radar in 1940, which was a fire control radar. Pensacola participated in the Battle of Midway, Battle of Santa Cruz Islands, and the Battle of Tassafaronga. In the latter battle, Pensacola was damaged by a Japanese torpedo and her decks were lit on fire. She had multiple 8-inch gun explosions. Uh, as a result of the torpedo hit, her magazines did start to detonate, but as they were doing their damage control stuff, they were able to get all that under control, and Pensacola would sail on to Tulagi Harbor while still on fire. For repairs, it would take them an additional 12 hours to get the fires under control. But Pensacola was saved and she did survive the war. Salt Lake City is unofficially recognized as the having participated in the most engagements of any other ship in the U.S. Navy. Salt Lake City participated in the Battle of Midway, the Battle of Coral Sea, the Battle of Cape Esperance, Battle of Kamandorsky Island, and the Battle of Philippine Sea. Both of these ships would go on to survive the war, and in 1948, they were used as targets for the Operations Crossroads nuclear test. Both survived both the Abel and Baker nuclear bomb tests. Pensacola was sunk as a target ship off the coast of Washington, and Salt Lake City was sunk also as a target ship off the coast of Southern California, both of them in 1948. In terms of their in-game gameplay performance, the Pensacola class is extremely map-dependent, and it boils down to this. If you're on a map with a lot of island cover, say Neighbors or Trident or um, New Dawn, if you get one of the rare Tier 7 matches that take place on that map, Pensacola can be quite strong in the, on those maps because her armament packs a very good punch. And if you can get in there at close ranges and you can catch a cruiser broadside, a Pensacola will absolutely devastate other cruisers, owing in large part to the fact that she has very favorable auto bounce angles. In fact, all of the 8-inch gunned U.S. cruisers have a 67.5 degree auto bounce angle, meaning the shells have to fall in that really narrow range from 67.5 to basically... Per, uh, parallel to the armor plate in order to bounce. So you're going to get a lot more penetrations against angled ships with the Pensacola. Um, the downside, though, is that on maps without island cover, she is extremely underpowered because she just flat doesn't have the ability to mitigate damage owing to the fact that she has basically no belt armor. In fact, if we pull up the armor configuration here, you can see she has four inches of belt armor over her magazines and three inches over the engine space. Yeah, we're not going to be winning any awards with this armor profile. Um, 
On the upside, you know, Wargaming recently buffed her concealment, and that has made it less of a chore to play on those more open maps, but honestly, the ship is still lacking on any map with without any cover. The upside is that her AP is quite strong. Again, very favorable auto-bounce angles. They do a lot of damage, and she has a lot of guns to, to use, and it's very accurate for an 8-inch gun cruiser. Her high explosive is workable. It's not the best, but it does start fires reasonably well, and if you do find yourself in a situation where the only thing you can shoot at is something that is nose on to you, I definitely recommend using that HE over the AP, unless you just the ship is almost dead and you have AP loaded. The ship is also really quite maneuverable for a Tier 7, and while the stats themselves may not be the best at Tier 7, um, it, the ship's rudder authority is impressive. Like, at half rudder, the ship wants to turn over the full, like, <laughs> heel over the full turn degree. It's, it's really quite impressive. Um, and then at full rudder shift, she just seems to turn on a dime. And for a Tier 7 cruiser, while her anti-aircraft suite is not nearly as strong as Cleveland, it is still much, much better than basically any other Tier 7 cruiser, with the exception of maybe Fiji. And as a result, uh, she does work pretty well as an escort ship. In fact, I, I would say that if she had radar, she would probably be a very strong escort ship. But unfortunately, she does not have radar. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about the stats. She has 34,300 hit points, and we've already talked about her armor. Again, 4 inches over the magazine, 3 inches over the engines. Not a whole lot there. The Cleveland has more. She does have a 4% damage reduction when torpedoes hit her. Woo! Um, she has 10 of the 8-inch 55 caliber Mark 14 Mod 1 or Mod 2 8-inch guns. They are mounted in turrets. You've got two turrets fore, two turrets aft. They are a double turret up front, triple turret, and then a triple turret, and then a double turret at the very aft end of the ship. Uh, very interesting configuration, but with these triple guns mounted up top, she is a bit top-heavy, something we don't have to worry about in-game. Uh, she also has secondaries. Uh, they come in the form of eight 5-inch 25 caliber Mark 19 Mod 6 guns. These also serve as part of the anti-aircraft suite. Um, they have a 4.7 kilometer range, although you probably won't be using these too terribly often. They do have a 9% fire chance, though, so if you do happen to find yourself within 5 kilometers of something and they do manage to hit, you can expect it to start fires reasonably well. That main battery does have a 15.7 kilometer max range and a reload time of 15 seconds, and the, may, the turrets do turn relatively quick as well, uh, 26.9 seconds on that. Uh, the HE fire chance will talk about 14%, and there you can see the AP shell velocity is higher than your HE shell velocity, and you can see 4,600 damage for the AP shells. In terms of that anti-aircraft suite, she does have 17 20 millimeter Orlikans. They kick in at 2 kilometers. I'm assuming that's without advanced firing training. Yep, that is without advanced firing training, but with basic firing training. So they do 73 DPS, thanks to that basic firing training. She also has 24 40mm Bofors and 6 quad mounts. And they have a range of 3.5 kilometers, 114 DPS. And then those 5-inch 25 Cal Mark 19 Mod 6 Dual purpose gun mounts, 70 DPS at 4.2 kilometers. You can push that out a little bit further with a 14 point captain. Uh, don't have a 14 point captain on this, on the Pensacola quite yet, but we'll get there someday. Max speed of 34. No, that's with the speed flags here. 32 and a half knots. I should really remove those before I do these videos. 32 and a half knots, so maximum speed, 620 meter returning radius. 5.6 second rudder shift time. And thanks to Wargaming for the concealment reduction, she has a 10.9 kilometer detection range by sea and a 6.9 kilometer detection range by air, making her a reasonably stealthy cruiser, which packs quite the wallop. <laughs> um, in terms of upgrade modules, main armaments mod one. Yeah, that's still not changed. Uh, in this second slot, there it, we've got two of these that I would consider viable. AA Guns Mod 2 for the 20% increase in the anti-aircraft gun range. 
Uh, if you're going to play this ship like, say, in Ranked and there happens to be a lot of carriers on, it might be worth tossing on AA Guns Mod 2 just so that you've got some extra range for your anti-aircraft guns because the anti-aircraft guns are relatively short-ranged at 4.2 kilometers at the furthest. So that's certainly something that's worth throwing on there. Uh, I run Aiming Systems Mod 1 for the decrease in dispersion of the main battery. I could care less about the secondaries, uh, but it is there as well as part of that mod. So I recommend Aiming Systems Mod 1 for general use. If you do happen to find yourself running into carriers or playing in divisions all the time and you want that extra anti-aircraft uh, range, definitely take that. Uh, AA Guns Mod 1. 2, sorry. AA Guns Mod 2. In the third slot, Propulsion Systems Mod 1 is really the only one that I really find viable on this ship. Uh, given how soft this ship still is, I definitely recommend taking Propulsion Mod 1 over Damage Control Systems Mod 1. I've explained it in other videos, but it seems like cruisers get their engines taken out and their steering gears taken out far more than they get set on fire or flooding, at least for extended periods of time. Usually that damage control comes up quick enough that you can take care of those things relatively easily. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't consider Damage Control Systems Mod 1 useful on this ship. Uh, on other nation cruisers, there's, there's a good choice to be made there, but not on the U.S. ones, certainly not in Pensacola with how soft she is. I think Propulsion Systems Mod 1 is more important than Steering Gears Mod 1, but if you wish to take Steering Gears Mod 1, certainly don't let me uh, dissuade you from that. Uh, in this last slot, Steering Gears Mod 2, 20% uh, reduction in the rudder shift time. And the reason why this is important for Pensacola is because an evading and WASD Pensacola is extremely hard to hit. The ship is very narrow. She does have a lot of superstructure, but that's only going to be, you know, over pens. We're talking less than a thousand, uh, less than 2,000 damage, excuse me. Less than 2,000 damage and over pens anytime a shell hits that upper superstructure area. Uh, so anytime you can actually avoid taking sh shells to the ship is a good thing. That reduction in rudder shift time just helps you avoid those shells at longer range. I personally find this to be more important, although I'm sure there are some people who prefer to sit near islands that think Propulsion Mod 2 is a good choice. If your play style is more towards the stationary sitting near islands, poking in and out and shooting at stuff as you can, Propulsion Systems Mod 2 isn't a bad choice. I personally prefer Steering Gears Mod 2 because I'm a little bit more aggressive and... Yeah, um, let's talk more in the battle video. We got quite an interesting battle video coming up. All right, so this battle is actually going to be from before the U.S. cruiser buff. So this is the old Pensacola with the old detection range. This is a tier 9 fight on Estuary. And unfortunately, um, I was messing around with recording my recording software. And when I recorded this, I f forgot to put sound in it. Well, more accurately... There's sound in it, but because I'm divisioned up with somebody, you can actually hear me talking to them, but you can't hear them talking to me. Um, so I'm muting the sound. So bear with me here. Hopefully we won't have to deal with too much in the way of uh, silence gaps in this. So Pensacola on this map, we've got a number of islands. So this ship is going to perform very well. In fact, in this match, we do right over a hundred thousand damage and for a Pensacola match, that's really quite good. Um, one of the things that I have learned in playing Pensacola is that the ship is quite maneuverable and you can really use that to your advantage. Uh, for those that have watched the How to Play series for the U.S. Battleships, you know that the U.S. battleships, uh, the early ones, the best way to play them is, is to angle just enough to bring all of your guns to bear and then wig wag your tail to bring the rear guns in line and then go back to being kind not bow in, but being angled. Uh, Pensacola takes to this uh, almost disturbingly well, almost as if they intended for it to be played that way. Um, and... I'm, you'll see me. I'm heading over to A here. We've got support, so this this isn't too much of an issue. I don't want to go all the way into A because, quite honestly, um, A would be suicide for this ship right now without any support right behind. 
and we have our first customer of the day. And uh, you can see I am detected here. Again, the reason why I'm detected has nothing to do with the um, recent changes. Remember, this is pre-buff to Pensacola's uh, detection. So uh, that was a Pensacola that popped up over in A. So we're going to slow... Well... We slowed down there for a little bit, and okay, so the Pensacola has come out. Well, he's going to be behind an island, but we're going to go ahead and shoot at him anyway, and we're going to turn away, we're almost immediately turn away. Uh, the reason for this is simply because, yeah, so there's the island. No hits. Um, the reason for that is because, as you can see, we caused him to miss. It turned us in a direction in which their battleship that is sitting there and their battleships that are approaching... Don't see me as the primary threat. I'm not exposing my broadside to them or anything of that nature. And so it just happens to work out best that way. Um, <laughs> I, it, it's funny because you, you just you never think about uh, the, the detection range and how ludicrous it was to have a cruiser that had a, a, such a massive detection range of 15.7, no, 15.2 kilometer detection range without concealment expert um and maybe that was with concealment expert i honestly don't remember but still ridiculous no matter how you slice that now that our, our friendlies have kind of come up we we can start to afford to push in towards the cap a little bit we can use and if, if this was the post buff we could use the the new stealth to get in closer but we can use the island cover to get closer to these ships and get some hits in you can see there Totally fired from stealth. Absolutely no one was around to detect that shot getting shot off. And no damage. <laughs> uh, we're off to a slow start. I promise you this picks up. Uh, it Shooting over islands, you know, that's a skill that you'll pick up. And um, there's no real easy way to put it. But hey, 460 damage. Woo! That was one heck of an overpen. Um, you'll get used to shooting over the islands and uh, taking advantage of, of poor enemy ships when they are hiding behind islands, but still spotted. Uh, that's just something you'll pick up as you go on. Uh, you'll get real used to the gun arcs on these ships. Uh, Pensacola has very flat gun arcs, which is oh, the large reason why she is so effective. Um, this Amagi is not interested in me. He is more interested in the Ganiza now, which... I'm shocked. Usually the Pensacola has a propensity to being focused down early on because the ship is soft. And being as soft as she is, uh, she's very, very citadel prone and usually good for a dev strike, especially if they sail broadside to you or anything of the sort. Uh, shooting over the island here to try and see if we can't maybe smack around that Iowa a little bit, but... Uh, again, we're, we're continuing to use our, our speed here to go ahead and create angles on these ships. And we're shooting HE at this North Carolina. I'm still detected. They are very interested in what's going on with the guys now. Poor Moon Puma. <laughs> He's being focused down by both those ships. Uh, torpedoes went out from Moon. Looks like he got two of them on that North Carolina. So we are going to start focusing on the North Carolina and we are trying to set him ablaze. Speaking of, ah, uh, still within the repair party time. No, it doesn't matter. He's dead. <laughs> uh, okay, switching back to the Amagi. Uh, we are still detected and as a result, I'm still shocked that nobody has taken umbrage to the fact that I'm still alive and undamaged. Um, we started the Amagi on fire. I'm good with it. Burn, baby, burn. Uh, even though he's broadside. Now, um, one of the things I've kind of taken to, and, and some of you guys will have picked up on in some of my later videos here, uh, I will start battleships on fire once, and then when they're broadside like this, I'll switch to AP, rather than start them on fire in a second place, because they have a tendency to burn the damage control party consumable which is great if you're trying to get them to use up their damage con, but is really bad if you are um, wanting to get big damage numbers and actually do damage. They're less likely to repair that one fire, especially when there's still ships around to start other ones. So 
Uh, using that one and letting it burn is good. Uh, in this case, we managed to start him on fire a second time and get the kill. So that is an Amagi down. That is a North Carolina down. And the steamroll continues. And now I've got AP loaded, but really what we're, we've switched back to HE and there's very good reasons for that. Uh, when it comes to shooting at targets that are presenting a bow or stern profile to you, it, it is not worth your time or effort to use AP on them unless that's just what you have loaded and they're about to die. Um, there is a destroyer over here that needs to be taken out, and I was trying to point that out to the um, other captain that's over there, the destroyer, or the battleship captain that's over there. Uh, shooting into smoke, this is another trait that you'll learn. Um, especially when you have a, a visual, you can see there we hit him four times and start him on fire. Although, no, he's burning. Yes, he is. So he is burning. Oh, he repaired it. So we got one good salvo off on him and then he managed to disappear. So, um, when you, when it comes to, to shooting in the smoke, you will get used. To, there's another fire. <laughs> that poor, there's two fires on that Iowa. <laughs> um, you will get used to, oh, and there's that destroyer, the Kagero. He is nearly dead. Now he is actually dead. You will get used to picking up. There is another fire on that Iowa. So we are up to three fires on that Iowa. It will not take long to burn him down. Uh, you will get used to where ships disappear at in smoke and, you know, the direction and the, the tactics that they really employ. And so you will get used to those uh, tactics and you will be able to predict, there goes the Iowa, you will be able to predict where they will be and plan accordingly. Now, in hindsight here, should have had AP loaded. Um, we will load AP after the salvo. We've started him on fire. He isn't going to live long enough to actually matter. Yep, there he goes. Okay, so he ramped our North Carolina uh, that's a that's a pretty good trade. In fact, if if I had to take that trade any other time, I would say that that is a, a solid trade. And so now we are going to go ahead and we are going to move to the other side of the map. Uh, <laughs> I didn't even realize it, but then Iowa was singing, "This girl is on fire." Okay, I'm gonna stop singing now. But uh, that's pretty funny. I just now realized that after watching this video. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was on fire in three places, so that definitely makes sense. Okay, they've got Nazumo that's left. Um, we're going to go on the north side of this because that's where their enemies are. We've got nobody countering. There is a destroyer that is most likely going to go for the cap. Being in a cruiser, it is my job to hunt down the destroyers. And 34,300 hit points still. We've not taken a single point of damage this entire match. So it's time to get in on this match. We're going to do some fun. Um, and for those who are, are particularly observant, Captain S. Trent next to me is uh, also in Sun Tzu Warriors. And Elite One Shot was somewhere in this match as well. And he also is a member of Sun Tzu Warriors. And if I remember correctly, this match came after a... Um, a meeting in which we did a, a clan drop. Uh, I could be wrong on that. Don't quote me on that. But we have a tendency to do that just because it's fun to play around with people. Katusov. So the Katusov is a particularly soft, light cruiser. I am in a particularly punchy, heavy cruiser. And... Hey, buddy. 4,700 damage and bounced his shells. The Katusov does have smoke and he is slowing down. So guess what, buddy? You're about to eat a whole bunch of citadels. Yep, four of them. <laughs> uh, yeah, you should know better. Um, so, oh, he does manage to get some hits off. Oh, we hit him again. This is this is like playing a guessing game when they're in smoke like this. It's actually kind of fun. Oh, he's he's doing some pretty good damage, but I think he's backed up. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to angle more towards him. Uh, we're going to... Yes, he shows up. Shoots. He scores. <laughs> 92,000 damage here. We are left with a Mogami, a Shiratsuyu, Poi, or a Zumo. And we have disappeared behind an island just in time to avoid getting shot at by that Azumo. Can we get the Mogami? 93,934 damage. 
Well, we got Shiratsu Poi here, so we should probably go ahead and take her out of this fight. And this captain actually had advanced firing training on him. Um, the This captain ended up on my Des Moines. This was after, so you see, I, I was grinding through the U.S. cruiser line because um, it was like one of the last cruiser lines that I have... Uh, well, it's one of the last lines that I don't have, I haven't gone down. So uh, I had spent the time and effort to actually uh, go down the line and, and grind through it to kind of see what it was like, man, it was rough. Um, in fact, a lot of the ships that I really didn't like, I'm sure are quite fine now, like New Orleans, for instance. I, I don't like New Orleans. I'm interested in playing her again just to see if she's improved any, but we are rapidly coming to the end of this game. We've got three capture points, 914 points, and we've got a broadside Azumo. Um, I would definitely recommend switching to AP in this circumstance. HE is what I got loaded. Trying to start him on fire here. Um, yeah, broadside Azumo. Probably could have killed him here if we had the HE loaded. Or, sorry, the AP loaded. In fact, I think I, I was just a little too focused on trying to start him on fire and not focused enough on just killing him outright. And, yep, 993 points, 108, 100,864. We switched to AP way too late, and we fired off our last salvo on the ticker ends. Um, broadsides like that, let somebody else start him on fire. Uh, that's That's probably the best tip that I can give you. Yep, 9,127 uh, of the experience after the various things. 1,843 base XP, three kills. No aircraft because there's no carriers and no scout planes got close, Just sad. There you can see the damage in fire and in HE and AP, and there is the credit screen. Anyway, Pensacola is a pretty fun ship to play, and I she will have a place in my port. Uh, for those times that I'm looking for a tier seven or pretty casual game and looking for a good challenge, um, it, it's not nearly as bad as people make it out to be. Just stick with it. The line does get better. Anyway, I'm your peacekeeper. Like, comment, subscribe, and thank you for watching.